Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 25, with George Yorgas. My name is Donny, I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions, the fears and personal philosophies of the world's free divers. The website can be found at freedivecafe.com. You can find George's show notes there and all the other episodes and the blog. You can listen to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. If you have an Android phone, you can try the Stitcher app, which I really like, and you can find it on a bunch of other apps too. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. This episode of the Free Dive Cafe is brought to you by 2B Free Equipment. I think 2B Free Boys and Lanyards, which have been developed by top Ukrainian freediver Alexander Bubenchikov, are probably the best in the world. The boys are incredibly durable and practical, and the lanyards are beautifully made and conform to Ida competition standards for lanyards. As a Free Dive Cafe listener, you have access to a very special deal Alexander has kindly offered us. That is, you will get free worldwide shipping on any of his amazing equipment. How cool is that? Shipping prices are often what turns me off buying something online, especially living in a country like Taiwan, where it's a bit out of the way. So with this free shipping offer, it'll really save you a bit of money. To take advantage of this offer, go to 2B Free Equipment. That's the number 2B Free Equipment. And in the order notes, you need to write Free Dive Cafe, Free Shipping. That'll let them know you're a Free Dive Cafe listener and you won't be charged for shipping. This offer is only available until April 30th, so get on it now. If you would like to show your support for the show, you can best do that by joining the Patreon family at patreon.com slash freedivecafe. Through Patreon, you can donate a few dollars to the show each month, which keeps the lights turned on and the coffee flowing. Another way to support the show is to go to audibletrial.com slash freedivecafe and sign up for a free 30-day trial with Audible. If you love audiobooks, this is a deal for you. It costs you nothing and you get a free audiobook of your choice. There are more than 180,000 titles to choose from. Go to audibletrial.com slash freedivecafe to get in on that. Okay, let's get on to episode 25. Uh, If I sound a little bit quiet, that's because it's first thing in the morning and I'm trying to record this before the horses start and the prayers start and all the noise from the streets. So um, if it sounds a bit odd, that's why. So when I opened up the raw audio files to begin post-production on this one, uh, I got a bit of a shock to discover that my own audio track had been distorted and damaged. I eventually managed to readjust the audio so my voice sounded kind of normal, if not 100% but I was unable to salvage a few bits and pieces of sentences that had been chopped out. I apologize for this, I still don't know what happened, but I've done my best to make it listenable. So you might notice that some of my questions don't really come through completely, but from George's answers you should be able to guess what I was asking. So who is George Yorgas? George was born in Athens in Greece. He has a degree in physical education and sports sciences and has continued to study kinesiology, ergophysiology and movement biomechanics. George is also a former competitive freediving athlete himself and I came to hear of him in his coaching capacity from George Panagiotakis on episode 14 of the podcast. George is going to tell us his own freediving story and then we'll dive into his tactics for training himself and his athletes. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's dive.
All right, so um, first of all, thank you so much for joining the Free Dive Cafe. Uh, thank you, Donny, uh, for inviting me here. And um, I'm very happy to talk with you today. Um, so you were suggested as a guest by uh, Yorgos Panagiotakis. Um, he's one of the athletes that you coach. And uh, I want to take a, a really deep dive into your approach to uh, coaching, training, and uh, try and forology and your training philosophy today. Um, but let's just step back a little bit and uh, find out a bit about yourself and your own free diving history. So um, where are you from and uh, how did you discover the world of free diving? So, Danny, I was born in uh, Greece in 1981, Athens. And um, from a young age, I was interested in sports, like uh, generally sports, but never interested about uh, sports with, with a ball, like football or basketball, I don't know why. <laughs> Although, um, after, uh, at uh, around the 10-year age, I started uh, swimming and uh, training in swimming, but the main reason was uh, scoliosis that I had in my back. Uh, but after some, uh, like six months, I, start, I started loving uh, this sport, and uh, for around 10 years, I trained and compete. Uh, you can say at high for uh, um, national level. And after around 10 years, uh, I get a little bit bored with swimming, and I was looking for something new, something to make me feel excitement again. So that was free diving and brothel diving, and this is how I start diving. Yeah, I probably, as uh, most of uh, divers, after seeing Big Blue was a very interesting thing, and uh, <laughs> okay, it start, uh, ignite ignite inside me uh, interesting about uh, brothel diving. But after after that, start reading a little bit some Greek magazines about uh, diving. And I think after that, everything uh, went to the direction that uh, we are now. You said that you first started swimming because of a scoliosis, so like a, a bend in your spine. Um, so a way to uh, treat your scoliosis? Yeah, I can say that. Even the, from my position now, I say that this is not the best option. Okay, this, this is an option, but not the best option. Although, yeah, the main reason that I started swimming was that because at first uh, they prescribed me some exercise at home that uh, after around one year I get really bored to do and I was almost avoiding them. So I asked for something else so I can treat my scoliosis and then my doctor said, okay, you can go uh, to swim if you like it more and you can find uh, more interest in that. And I said, okay, let's try it. And yeah, after that I stopped and uh, for around 10 years I was there in the water. When you started free diving, was that exclusively? Uh, did you just go from swimming in the pool to free diving in the pool, or did you also? Yeah, do I've done everything. Well? Uh, at the same time, I've tried the pool, I've tried uh, the uh, depth, but first I think the pool because I was already in the pool. So sometimes at the end of my training, the swimming training, I was practicing on my own. Like let's try twenty-five meters or fifty meters without fins uh, back then. Uh, so it was very easy to pass over and start um, uh, taking my uh, breath hold capabilities in um, in pool water but uh, the sea didn't uh, came a, a lot uh, faster after like well, maybe one month I start uh, diving but first I've done a school a free diving school uh, some lessons with uh, FDI um, I, if I recall correct is a free dive uh, institute probably yeah and uh, this was my first experience because I was um, I was a little bit anxious about safety and uh, if I can make it and if I'm uh, safe to dive and if I know all the things I have to know. So that's why I've uh, take, I've took the school and uh, start diving uh, in a more uh, a good technique and uh, more knowledge about what I've, I was doing. So you said that you um, the the first school that you uh, learned with was FDI. Yeah, a big organization, yeah, mainly, yes. So, um, was that like near Athens that you were doing depth for the first time? Yeah, I was mainly um, in Athens all, all of my life. And uh, you, can ha you can find like 50 meter depth uh, if you travel for around one hour. 
45 minutes, one hour is the maximum distance for finding a 50 meter depth. So if you're gonna go, if you wanna go deeper, you should travel more, like maybe two and a half hours. Uh, for me at least, was uh, Lutraki and uh, Ireo. Uh, then mainly this is a problem. Uh, if you live here in Athens, uh, you need to travel and you need to spend a lot of time uh, in road. Yeah, but uh, 50 meters is pretty good uh, for, a, for a place to start, yeah, it's right? That's, it's that's perfect. quite it's perfect. reasonable. Yeah. I was going to say, close to such a big city as well. It's, um, that's yeah, great. and uh, you, you didn't have to swim a lot. It, it was uh, very close to the shore. So you can you were swimming like some like 100, 100 meters and you can find uh, easy 30 meters uh, depth. Was there something, um, when you first started training, either in the pool or in depth, was there something that you found especially difficult or was there some kind of challenge that you had to overcome? Overcoming pressure on my chest. Uh, I think this, this was yeah, the hardest thing because it was very easy for me to hold my breath. And uh, I think my first static was like four minutes or three and a half minutes easy with, without thinking about it. And... Uh, my first dynamic probably was around 100 meters, but uh, compression in my chest was uh, something uh, very new for me. And uh, I remember, like, like now, I, I thought if this is free diving and uh, diving generally, okay, probably I choose Don't wrong. Do that. This is not my sport. Yeah, <laughs> it was like an elephant uh, crossing my chest, and uh, in a depth like uh, 80 meters, nothing. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, equalization wasn't the real problem, the, the real problem, but compression was something else for me, yeah. Yeah, this experience, I think uh, that is very common in most of uh, divers, but there are some uh, guys or girls that they can dive uh, directly, like they have the ability uh, in matter of pressure to dive like 30 meters and have other, uh, other problems like uh, uh, fear or um, apnea level, apneistic level. So, yeah, but I think one of the most common is handling the pressure on your chest. What is your favorite discipline in free diving? For me, uh, technically speaking, mainly, I think dynamic, dynamic apnea with fins or without fins. Uh, and I prefer it compared to diving in the sea and static apnea because as a coach, always, you can do more for your athlete. You can do more things to help them. Diving in the sea is a little bit different and mostly I think that you can do a lot. You can prepare physically your diver, your athlete, but you can control like equalization problems or pressure handling problems or other things. And the second is uh, the second big reason for me for choosing dynamic apnea in pool and generally pool disciplines is safety. I think this is a hobby and safety must uh, come first. Did you also um take part in free diving competitions? Yes, uh, from 2002, I think, I think is my I was my first competition until uh, 2007 was my last. But uh, in all disciplines, and sea and pool and everything, yeah. And how did you, uh, how did you think that you enjoyed? Uh, mostly not. I think I, I was enjoying more, more training yeah. than uh, <laughs> competitions. And I think was this was one of uh, the main reasons that I didn't excel in this uh, sport. Um, psychological pressure and uh, probably uh, I couldn't handle it uh, the right way. Um, although I had a lot of uh, abilities in a non-competition uh, environment, in competition environment, it was always hard for me. Uh, but uh, after two or three years, probably I think think that I was improve a lot and uh, start handling a little better uh, all the stress but generally I would say that competition wasn't my style uh, generally yeah I didn't like that I prefer training more and was that why you all because I mean you're still quite a young man right you're just a couple of years older than me 35 or 36 right so you gave up competitive diving just because uh, you didn't like it it didn't suit you psychologically it wasn't working for you? No, that wasn't the reason. Uh, I get bored again. <laughs> like saturation, feel saturated and uh, had a lot of other interests generally. Uh, my work and uh, science and things that I love to do. And, you know, is the t is, it, free diving is time consuming. And time consuming, not only the time you train, but the time you think about it and you spend 
really big uh, high energy levels for for thinking and uh, giving solutions to problems it's not just like okay, I'll go two hours for training or I'm gonna spend four hours for go there and diving there's a lot more so yeah time uh, efficiency and time generally was the main reason that uh, I decided that it is time to pass to something new and let my diving experience uh, finish there Tell us a little bit about your uh, your your educational background. What did you uh, study, and how did that set you up for your your later uh, career as a coach? Uh, as I told you, as I sent you in my bio, I have a university degree for a couple of different university here in Athens in physical science, in physical education and sports science, and um, after that, it was much easier to start thinking more about how to train or coach someone. Uh, first, I was the one that I coached, my own self. From 2002, that I was uh, in the university, I would start experimenting with my own self about uh, what you can do to be better, to perform better, uh, to tapering better, to be ready in the competition and not the uh, off-season. So I think my first athlete was my own self. After that, uh, and after I decided that uh, I want to take a break and move forward, uh, coaching was the next step. So I started using uh, knowledge, uh, practical and scientific knowledge for doing my best for my athletes. So what kind of training techniques do you focus on for your freediving athletes? And how much of it takes place in the pool or outside the pool? Um, I think our training is mainly in the pool like 90% probably. And um, what I found out uh, during years is that uh, the most important thing um, is technique, mastering the technique, and specifically the propulsion technique. I think this is number one for me. Uh, if you manage to solve these problems or reach a high level, then you can start worrying about um, other techniques or holding your breath or doing uh, more uh, exotic things. Right, so you, th you say that the, uh, the, just the very way that you move your body in the water yes. is the first thing to concentrate on. Yes, the first and most important thing is about uh, efficiency, how you're going to spend energy. Most of divers, I think, um, they can, uh, they're not using efficient their energy. And uh, it's not about increasing your apneistic capabilities but learn to use uh, more efficient the energy that you can produce without oxygen or, or with the oxygen you carry in your blood. So technique is number one for me. And if you perform in uh, the sea, so the sea is going to be your, your court, the, the place that you're going to learn the technique. And you know, technique, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's totally different. Uh, propulsion technique in the sea uh, compared to the prop propulsion technique in the swimming pool. So you need to focus there. Did you bring anything over from your background in swimming in terms of technique that can apply to freedivers? No, I don't think so. Uh, because uh, what I was swimming and generally swimming uh, is not, we're not using fins. So we're just using fins for training, some training uh, parts. But uh, this is the main reason that everything changed. When you have uh, two fins or uh, a monofin, it's a totally different thing. Okay, maybe the movement is similar, okay, in the monofin compared to the butterfly, the kick, but uh, although it's different. So in swimming, again, you're competing for speed. You want to go as fast as you want. In uh, dynamic apnea or diving in the sea, it's different. You want to go and come back. Time, you can say it doesn't matter a lot. It matters at the end, but not about who, who is going to be the faster, okay? So things are different. So that's why I see that, uh, no, I didn't bring a lot, maybe nothing from uh, swimming. What about uh, fin swimming? Is that something that you, you did yourself or that was that you could transfer some uh, technique into the pool? Experimenting, yes, mainly with my own self uh, as an athlete and figuring out things about uh, efficiency and uh, how you can move. As I recall, I was probably the first guy, I don't know, maybe yeah, here in Greece and maybe more uh, around the world, that start uh, stop between kicks. Um, 
in 2002, in my first competition, dynamic apnea competition uh, with Finns. I was doing that stuff and all, all, all people around asked me, why you stop between the kicks? Like uh, one, two, three kicks and then stop with two fins, you know, and not a, mon a monofin. For monofin, is even much better to have a small stop. So uh, I think that my own uh, experience in practicing while I, while I was an athlete um, helped me figure out a lot of things that uh, helped my athletes uh, later. So just for the benefit of the listeners, could you just explain what you mean by stopping between the kicking and why that um, turned out to be a better technique? Uh, like uh, you're going to go for one or two kicks, depends. You can go for four kicks and then uh, stop for a while, like uh, glide, and then restart again. And it's like a cycle that is... Uh, you can do uh, while you dive. So why I think it's better? Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I say that it's better because of results. Uh, it's like practical better. But uh, I think if you if you don't do it right, if you stay long in the glide, it's not a very good idea. You can you can have the different results. Um, there is a sweet uh, spot. So about how much you have to glide. And uh, it depends. Depends on many different factors. What kind of supplementary training have you found to be most beneficial? Non free diving related activities like weightlifting or yoga, high intensity interval training, things like this. I think generally resistant training is a very good idea, but mainly for diving in the sea. Uh, with George, we have a very good experience without training at all resistant training for like around three years. He achieved a lot uh, with 100% training on the water. Nothing outside that. No high intensity with resistant training or yoga or other things. So I think resistant training is a very good uh, supplemental work for constant weight. I will say easier. For dynamic apnea, I don't think that is a must, but maybe some uh, Maybe it's going to help some athletes to perform a little bit better. It depends on your starting level and the basic strength you have on your legs or your trunk and generally your body. What, what kind of resistance training would then apply to constant weight? Uh, very basic things like squatting, uh, hingings, like deadlifts, um, trunk uh, exercises for obliques and generally the abdomen. Um, not a lot of work for the upper part of your body, mainly because of the special needs of flexibility and movement of the thorax uh, and the need for raising your arms above your shoulders. So lower uh, body generally exercises. So like um, lower body heavy compound heavy with, a, with a heavy weight or would you use lighter weights for more repetitions? What's, what would be better do you think? Yeah, we're using a, when we do that, we, we use a periodization and heavy for us is maximum uh, eight repetition. It's not going to go lower, no reason. Uh, the value is not so high and the risk of uh, for trauma is uh, higher. So we're going to go for a range of eight repetition and we can reach a range of 20 or 25 repetition. I saw you in a, a video um, you, just, you posted not too long ago. I think you, it looked like you were doing some kind of like a, a leg press with a band while you were pinching your nose. So I wonder if you were also incorporating some hypoxic training into your resistance training. Uh, never. And uh, I don't think that this was my video and I was in this video. <laughs> I never should it like that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I don't think that's a very good idea to hold your breath while you uh, do resistance training. So, um, for different uh, reasons, scientific reasons at least for me. So, yeah, uh, I didn't. I, I won't. I won't say that this is a nice option. Holding your breath while you do resistance training. So, um, what would those scientific reasons? I think be? Uh, blood pressure mainly. I think that uh, uh, this is not a very good idea. Generally, when, when you hold your breath anyway, your blood pressure is increased. Uh, when you, when you uh, have resistant training sessions uh, at, uh, 
high resistance, again, your blood pressure is increased. And uh, I don't think it's specific to. Um, you're going to have a high resistant while you dive. So high resistant. Uh, move your legs and kick the water. Never go so difficult or so hard or so resisted. So generally I try to be specific in my training sessions. And that's why I usually don't do resistant training for my athletes. And I mainly concentrate on water. All right. Yeah, I just checked your um, your Facebook page and I can't see any sign of that video. So um, I guess I must just have been maybe dreaming or something. And I, I, I don't know. So maybe it's just my overactive imagination. Uh, what kind of... Uh, is there a you promote to support a free diving athlete? I'm not a specialist in, in nutrition, but uh, I will say that... Uh, as I see that generally in static apnea at least, uh, there is a higher reason for consuming less energy and have a lower body weight. In dynamic apnea, I will say that balanced diet uh, with a lot of carbohydrates, uh, it's a good idea. Um, about supplements, I think there are supplements. <laughs> they, they, they can do a lot for you. But uh, yeah, you can use some things probably like uh, creatine or... I don't know, like carnosine maybe, uh, but there are not a lot of scientific uh, information out there to say that, yeah, this is a good idea, yeah, you're going to have results, or say, this is a valid uh, supplementation uh, protocol. So, yeah, you can advise generally, but you're never going to know exactly if this helps or not. So, the, the like general idea about uh, supplementation. I think a balanced diet is very important. And if you go for dynamic, uh, generally use uh, a lot of carbohydrates. Yeah, and uh, when you're using a supplement for improving something, uh, you never know uh, what is going to happen under the situation of holding your breath. You know, all those supplements are tested when you're, you're, when you're breathing normally. So <laughs> chemistry and physiology of diving is a, a total different thing. So uh, let's say you're going to use baking soda because you saw that increasing 18% performance of uh, cyclists, the speed ones, that you want a higher aerobic threshold or a high, higher anaerobic uh, energy production. Okay, nice idea. But what is going to do to your CO2 levels? And uh, if you're going to hyperventilate without hyperventilate because your alkali, uh, alkaline is higher, your, pH, your pH, uh, blood pH is higher, so you never know what you're going to do. You're going to fix something, improve something, and make worse something else. So generally, I'm not uh, in an advice about supplementation, uh, especially about supplements that working in other sports, but they never tested in a breath hold situation. So this is my yeah thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Brains, um, about your opinion about something um, that's been interesting me recently because it's something that I really want to get to the bottom to to understand is uh, it's pretty it's fairly commonly accepted in the free diving world that steady state cardio like running for long distances in the aerobic zone and other forms of aerobic or endurance training are counterproductive um, often the the physiological reasons given would be uh, it's said that there would be too much capillarization, which is basically an increase in the number of small blood vessels in an area of the body, and also um, like an increase in the number of mitochondria in the cells. Could you explain for myself and for the listeners what you think about that and why increased capillarization and mitochondria would be counterproductive? I'm not a big fan in this theory. You know, well, I'm, I'm I'm excited to hear because yeah. as a long distance runner who's yeah. m moving into free diving, I'm looking for all the help I can get that enables me to keep up my running without feeling too bad about it. <laughs> okay, uh, let me let me explain. I think that uh, there is a right moment for everything. Uh, at least in my programs, there is a moment for aerobic training. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna train like uh, a marathon. But uh, we're going to have some aerobic uh, training. And we're not going to swim like two hours in a row, but we're going to swim for some interval or long distance uh, in an aerobic threshold. So 
increasing capillaries generally, uh, okay, you could say that this is not a good idea because uh, more blood is uh, reaching the limbs and so you're losing oxygen that is not going to the brain and okay, I know the theory. Or uh, you can uh, increase mitochondria, which uh, they're going to use oxygen in your muscle and not... But, you know, there are more things. You, you should think about there are two... Th two main, re main ways that you can increase um, breath hold times. One is manage to um, save as much more energy you can on your body, in your body, like your blood, your lungs, and uh, transfer it to the right, uh, uh, the right place. The second is how you can produce maximum energy without uh, the existence of oxygen, like anaerobically. So you want both systems to be in high level and high condition. Not the same time. This is true. You can be in the same time great in endurance and great in anaerobic production. And you're not, you're not going to combine them and you're not going to cross them. But in uh, different phases of training, you can go easily to both. And you, can, you have to think another thing that is very important. You can train yourself anaerobically for uh, 11 months or 12 months. It's impossible. You're going to crash. So then you're going to decide that you're going to train for six months or five months. Or uh, how are you going to train in a high level of anaerobic, uh, anaerobic training if you don't have a base, of aerobic base? So I'm not saying that sprinters are running like uh, two sets of 10 kilometers, <laughs> like uh, track, uh, track and field sprinters. Okay. So, yeah, you're not going to over exceed. But you need to train uh, your aerobic system because it's not only about capillaries and mitochondria. It's about um, uh, heart efficiency, uh, uh, heart um, stroke and volume. It's about transferring oxygen from your lungs. It's about uh, many, many other things. And where you know if uh, increasing capillaries or mitochondria in your brain? Uh, where, where do you know if uh, doing some other changes that are helping breath hold diving? So we don't know yet. And generally, I think science uh, needs a lot of steps forward to really know about what is helping and what is not. And for the moment, as long as the sport is not so uh, famous, uh, there is a big gap. So I'm not too fast to say, yeah, this is not good, this is good. I'm observing a lot. This is my main way of improving, not only science, because science needs uh, a lot of uh, new uh, experiments and knowledge to gain. So observing is very, very important. And for me, for my practical experience, uh, observing uh, aerobic training in my athletes was never hurt them. Okay, in real life, like, Panagiotakis performing three years in a row with doing endurance training. Not before the competition, of course, but <laughs> in the early phase of his uh, training uh, period. Yeah, he trained a lot in aerobics. Yes. Yeah, I think it's hard to argue that the, the general benefits of aerobic training, such as, you know, increased uh, heart efficiency, you know, better, uh, you know, stroke volume and heart rate. Like these general uh, improvements in the heart health and the aerobic health must be good for the, the free diver anyway. And it doesn't seem that there's enough evidence right now to demonstrate that a, a trained endurance runner who is uh, untrained and a, a sprinter who was untrained in free diving, if you put them together and put them on the free, same free diving protocol, right? Um, yeah, but there are a lot of uh, other factors that uh, they're going to affect the end result. So this experiment is a little bit hard, uh, technically. But uh, I want to add something more. You never uh, forget that when you finish a dive, when you start breathing again, you're going to need your aerobic system to start recovering. So second thoughts here. You, you, you have high dependence on aerobic, uh, endur aerobic endurance and aerobic uh, and endurance level generally. It's very important for me. Yeah, very interesting. And um, for the time being, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. keep up. Nice idea. As well. <laughs> Unless I want to continue running. I'm not a competitive runner, but the main reason I want to continue running is because it makes me feel good, right? 
it um when i'm when i'm running regularly my resting heart rate drops i feel more energetic through the day i feel uh more relaxed um so this is obviously going to help me in my uh my free diving training too yeah you, you should not worry about that i'm sure about that uh, at least for the moment uh, i don't have um any clue about uh abandoning a uh, massively aerobic training because of uh, harassing your anaerobic abilities and bro hold uh, abilities. Are there any uh, training techniques or ideas that you think are overused or even just plain useless? I think that, uh, as I told you before, uh, most of the divers, when, you, when they start, because this sport, they call it breath hold diving or uh, apnea or apneistic uh, abilities or I don't know why they, they, they consist on holding their breath and I thought uh, I think like uh, maybe 15 years before uh, Martin, Martin Stepanek said something very important and I'm going to repeat it now hold your breath less because you're consuming so much energy uh, that uh, it's not allowing you and is get a conflict with concentrating on your technique First, be efficient. It's very, very important. And another thing, you never know how uh, doing a lot of apnea and then training with a lot of uh, breath hold, it's going to affect uh, your uh, neurological system and how you can recover for that. Because here, it's not only that, like you're going to overload the, the, the anaerobic or aerobic system. You're going to overload your brain. So we don't have specific protocols for each athlete that is going to recover from this volume of uh, breath hold diving or training in one week or two weeks and uh, when it's going to be ready for perform again or how much uh, volume you should uh, add to your training. So as long as we have great fields and we don't know exactly how to handle volume with breath hold diving, it's very important to not overexciting there and concentrate in uh, more important things. At the end, when you reach a high level of technique, you're going to go and train in apnea and breath hold. But uh, I think most of the starters and the athletes, and maybe not only the starters, but the higher level athletes, uh, overconsume themselves in uh, breath hold. So you were coaching uh, George Panagiotakis in the lead up to his uh, world records in Dynamic Kirku in Finland. Uh, could you maybe just... Talk us through a little bit the training process, the periodization, and what was most important for George to work on during that time. How does how do you prepare for an event like that? Uh, George was a very good diver. He was very capable in, in holding his breath until we met uh, in 2013. Uh, but uh, he couldn't perform in dynamic apnea specifically. He was good in depth, good in static. What George did wrong back then, it was training a lot with breath hold diving. The first thing we've done to help him reach this high level in dynamic apnea with fins was concentrating in technique. After mastering his technique, managed to perform in very, very high level with the existent uh, apneistic capabilities. You have a diver that can hold his breath for in the surface like eight minutes, let's say. It is impossible not to overcome 250 meters in dynamic apnea if he had a basic or a good technique. So mainly in the first year, we tried to manage his technique. And uh, it, we didn't manage that in 2013 and 14. But uh, after two years uh, with um, practicing and watching videos and say, let's change that, let's do that. let's We went up in a very, very high level technique that uh, is reproducible. This is the second very important thing. Technique is not something that you buy and you have it on yourself and keep it there forever, for every time. You're going to practice, practice until you automate it. When you automate the technique and you can have it the same uh, any, any, any time, you can go for it and be in a efficient way uh, capable of swimming, uh, you, you then you can start concentrating in other things. So about periodization. For me, generally, the first phase and the first months of uh, his season is uh, consists mainly in endurance training. Uh, not a very, very high volume, but 
yeah, there is an endurance training, mainly in the pool. Uh, after four or five months, we're going to start uh, introducing some uh, anaerobic sets with higher intensity, more speed. And as we're getting closer to the competition, yeah, we're going to reduce a little bit more the aerobic training. We're going to minimize and concentrate generally in aerobics. This is a very general uh, training plan. Mm. How much uh, focus did you place on the mental preparation uh, for that dive? I don't know that because it's mental and it is uh, in, in George's mind. Uh, support, yes. You need to support a lot. And whenever you are on top and you try to overcome the elite level, you need a lot of strength. Not only physically strength, but mentally strength. And, you know, I don't have a specific technique about uh, helping my athletes. But uh, the better connection you have with, with your athlete, the better you know him, like... Uh, more than an athlete and closer to a friend, uh, I think you can handle better and you can find a better way to help him and support him um, do his best. Specifically in Finland, George was a little, uh, very, very anxious and uh, we have a, a lot of complication during the training year, the training season. And I still wonder how he managed to pull this dive because... Uh, as I saw him the day before, uh, it was very anxious and exhausted mentally. Although uh, he managed to find a way, the right moment, and I think uh, competition pressure is uh, the right button uh, for George that ignite inside him the the right mentality. Uh, yeah, uh, transformed to. An unbelievable diver and managed to do this uh, 300 meter. Physically, we were ready, but George, until the last moment, for some reason, not because he didn't believe in me or my session or my training techniques, because we've managed in 2015 too uh, in Belgrade. But when you're reaching this point that you need to overcome yourself and uh, break the rules, you can say, and set in something new, uh, you always have uh, second thoughts. And you feel that, okay, probably I'm not ready, or maybe I'm ready, or maybe I'm not. And <laughs> there is a game. And uh, it depends if you manage to find the right way to handle all this situation, the right moment. And lucky for him and me, he managed to do that in 2016. For someone like myself, who is uh, currently unable to train often in the water for lack of, uh, you know, many reasons, good buddies, don't have access to a pool um, where I can rent a lane and use equipment, things like this. My training, and how would you structure the training? Yeah, we'll go with uh, with in the first uh, season and period, the first month, and we'll go for endurance training. Running will be a nice idea. Maybe bike depends how you like what you like more. Uh, resistant training for sure, but uh, creating for some basic strength at first months. And as you moving forward, uh, changing the intensity in uh, running or bicycle and in resistance training too. So you can have the same periodization as you're training someone in the pool, but in different, uh, uh, with a different way. The same thing for running and bicycle and resistance training. You have the similar pattern, but you just don't have the water. Nothing changed really. Before I do my instructor course, I'm going to have a month uh, on location to dive as much as, uh, as I want. Um, I, I want to be at a good um, fitness level and a good diving level before I do the course. Um, so I have three months before I, before I attend the course. Would you incorporate things like apnea walks and, and apnea exercises into the... Yes, into the yes for sure, training? yeah. And apnea walk is a nice idea, but uh, uh, thinking about safety, I would prefer something like a static uh, bike. Uh, yeah, it will be better for you, uh, for the matter of safety. And uh, yes, I will use uh, some um, FRC static apneas on bed and yeah, stuff like that, because you don't have any other option. So the, the closest you can go is that one. That way. Yeah, yeah. It's good. They, they don't help. They, they work. They work a lot. But the only thing is here how much you can handle the technique. Uh, 
the the months or days that you have uh, access to the pool and you can say okay after five or six months or one year to go to the pool how i can how how can i know that my body's remember remember or remember and not hated the technique and uh, i'm gonna perform well you never know you don't know the more you do the better the automation but uh you don't have any other option so yeah this is the way you can move you have a personal training facility near athens um called body solutions what is Body Solutions all about and what kind of services do you offer there? Okay, this is a, a personal training studio, which I mainly train uh, small groups of four people with resistant training. And the main philosophy of Body Solutions is helping people moving better and feeling better and look awesome and generally have more fun with uh, their bodies and their movement abilities. If someone was interested in uh, being coached in free diving by you, would, is that something that you uh, are you open to taking new athletes? Would they contact you through Body Solutions? Yeah, but you know, um, from 2015, uh, I declare, you can say with a way that uh, I'm not going to train any other athlete about for brothel diving competition or uh, dynamic apnea, or whatever. Uh, this is a decision that I took after 2015. Because I will start feeling a little bit saturated again with playing the codes. <laughs> so it's yeah. time for some. Uh, yeah, you know, there is a lot of stress there. I don't say that uh, other fields in my life they're not creating stress, but um, there are around almost yeah, 17, 15 years that I'm around Berthold, even like an athlete or like a coach. And I start feeling a little bit uh, saturated again. And so I, I just wait uh, my athletes to finish. I'm not going to let them down and say, okay, now go on your own. But I'm waiting to finish their career and uh, yeah, start uh, doing the things that I love more, which is helping people uh, live better and perform better, but not in the field of uh, breath hold or apnestic. Are you still doing any diving yourself? Do you still take part in any uh you get together with friends to do some pool training and things like this or are you are you putting that behind you no uh, as i recall probably i'm uh, away from the pool water around two years and i'm diving only in the sea sometimes in the summer with friends yes for having fun and shooting a photo uh, uh in vacation if i was uh, if, I, if i go in a greek island and I enjoy it a lot. It's much better. It's, uh, it's, this is the way I want diving in my life at the moment. Uh, yeah, it fulfills my needs and makes me feel happy. Do you have any other interests outside of free diving? Any other hobbies? Or Traveling. I love traveling. And I discovered that the last uh, seven years. Um, watching movies. Yeah, it's something that I like. The... I don't have a lot of time to do that. Although, yeah, when I have some spare time, I can do that. Mainly reading scientific things about my work and how can be more efficient and help my people. I love my job. And, uh, consuming a lot of my time, but consuming with a good way. Like I don't even feel that it's consuming me. It's like, um, you know, I feel alive from that. And I hope that. I'm not going to get bored that too, <laughs> but uh, this is a passion that holds on around 10 years and I feel very full of that and very strong and feel that I can continue. It's a great feeling, helping people move better and you never know that until you find someone that loses abilities, uh, ability of movement and autonomy and when you give him back that uh, thing, uh, feeling is uh, unbelievable. And uh, yeah, for the moment, I, I think I'm not. I'm not going. I can't change that. It's if you manage generally to find a job that uh, fulfills both, can help you live, earning your money, but uh, same time uh, make you feel like that. I think uh, you're very lucky, and uh, yeah, you should not stop it uh, until the end. No, no, it's a very noble pursuit, and I, I wish you uh, a lot of continued success in your career, whatever you decide to do. Thank you, Danny. Are you the kind of person that has a morning ritual or do you just kind of wake up and see what happens? Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to say I have a ritual. I'm like, 
starting up, waking up uh, almost on my own, six o'clock and in the morning. And uh, no, I'm ready. I'm prepared from the, the last day. I am ready to do, jump in and start working. I'm working a lot of hours, like maybe 15 hours per day, sometimes even more. And uh, I don't think that um, I need a specific ritual. It's like automation. Everything is automated. It's uh, not even think about it. It's just happening. So, um, you mentioned that you like to read, um, and you said you like to read a lot of, I guess, uh, research that applies to your uh, your career and your interests in that area. Do you have a book that you can recommend? Because I always ask the question if uh, if you have a book or an author that you would like to recommend for the listeners, and it can be in any genre about anything, fiction, nonfiction. About science, generally in my field, uh, is movement impairment syndromes for uh, Sylvia Sharman. And uh, that's movement impairment syndromes. Yeah, syndromes. Yeah, it's a great book for uh, exercise specialists and kinesi- kinesiologists. But not not light reading before bedtime. I <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> I like it uh, for before bedtime. Yeah, it's relaxes me a lot. I don't know why. Maybe I'm, I'm muscle hit. Who knows? But uh, lately, I read a interesting, uh, very interesting book, uh, the Forty Eight uh, Laws of Power of Robert Greene. And uh, just uh, Elfers, and I love it. I'm not finished it yet, but uh, I'm loving it. Yeah, and it's out of science, but uh, holds me very good company. Nice. Yeah, I'll put those um, for those who are listening. I'll put those books in the show notes, as always. Building up a little uh, a little library of recommended books now on the website. Yeah. So uh, good. Thank you for your recommendations for the future. Um, I mean, you've pretty. I guess you've pretty much made it clear that you wish to continue with your career and your personal, um, your, your physical uh, fitness studio, um, helping people, improving their lives. Do you have any uh, grand plans or anything big for the future that you uh, you're going to get to at some point? Yeah, I will say that um, my main goal is after the next five or ten years, manage to have some. Uh, extra uh, time for me and my wife and traveling. Uh, this is the main thing that I'm really missing for the moment. Uh, so yeah, uh, I will go for better autonomy in working hours and um, manage to stress for me and my wife. Yeah, And traveling mainly. I would like to travel a lot more. So George, how can people find you online? Um, do you have a website? Do you have a Facebook page and that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, it's uh, bodysolutions.gr uh, and the same thing for Facebook. Okay, so I'll put those in the show notes for those who want to get in touch with George. Of course, if you are a free diver and you want to get in touch with George about coaching, uh, don't because George is finished with that, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my questions and uh, explain everything clearly. And yeah, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Thank you, Johnny, for inviting me here and uh, the interest about my opinion and knowledge uh, for free diving and generally. And it was a very nice time uh, to spend with you. Thank you very much. Millions of thanks to George, it was a pleasure to talk all things freediving with him and let's wish him success with all his plans for the future. Don't forget to take advantage of that special offer from To Be Free Equipment. Uh, they have amazing gear and you get free worldwide shipping when you use the message Free Dive Cafe Free Shipping in the order notes. Go to To Be Free Equipment and check it out. That's available until April 30th. Feel free to add me on Facebook where I am Donny Mac, D-O-N-N-Y-M-A-C. Follow me on Instagram where I am Donny McFar, D-O-N-N-Y-M-C-F-A-R. And otherwise, if you have any questions or suggestions, you can also contact me through the website. 
I love hearing from you guys, so don't be shy. Until episode 26, dive safe.